Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Monday Night Live. My name is Brendan Malone. Uh, before we get into tonight's guest, just a couple of quick administrative things to get out of the way. First of all, how do you like my jacket? $29 on sale at Hallenstein's. For those who are wondering if that's some sort of luxurious item he's wearing there. This guy thinks he's Mike Hosking. <laughs> um, just a couple of quick administrative things to get out of the way. Um, if you are not already a subscriber to the YouTube channel, tonight's show, the Monday Night Live show, has its own YouTube channel. It's found at mondaynightliveshow.com. That's mondaynightliveshow.com. Get along there, please, and go and subscribe and hit that little bell to get the notifications. We're sorting out a few little technical issues at the moment. Uh, in coming weeks, we are going to be streaming on both platforms, so Facebook and YouTube. So please go and like the channel. What we do at the moment is within 12 to 24 hours of each episode, the previous night's episode is uploaded to YouTube so you can share with friends. Uh, also, the Facebook page. It's found at facebook.com forward slash Monday Night Live Show, Monday Night Live Show. Get along there and uh, give that a like. Uh, thank you, Rebecca. She says that she likes the jacket, loves the jacket. <laughs> My wife took a little bit of convincing, uh, but yeah, we got there in the end. And lastly, please consider supporting the channel on Patreon. For as little as $1 a month, that's all it takes. If you want to give a little bit more, as much as you want to, to help support the channel, please do that. Uh, the channel is found at patreon.com forward slash left foot media. That's patreon.com forward slash left foot media. As I said, you can support for as little as $1 a month. Every little bit helps this independent media startup trying to get a bit of an alternative voice going on these issues that really matter. Right, with that, all that boring stuff out of the way, let me now move to my guest. And I'm going to do this with a bit of style here as I, I bring him onto the screen. Uh, Elliot, welcome aboard, mate. How are you? Oh, for my year, it's so so wonderful to be here, and thank you so much for uh, bringing me on there, Brendan. Awesome. My my pleasure. Now I'm going to give you a proper introduction here. So this is Elliot Akile. Did I say that right? Oh, uh, you know. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, white boys, white boys, white boys, be trying. Uh, <laughs> well, you know. Well, I was uh, in the 80s when I was going to the YMCA camps and, uh, you know, they'd be rigging up the names. Woo! My brother and I would just look at each other and, hey. But it's uh, Eli Piki Lee. But it was all good. It's okay, all good. so let me give you a proper introduction. Now that now that I've made a real mess of that, uh, I didn't do too bad for a white boy. Um, so let, let me see. Uh, Elliot is the new Conservative Party candidate for Takanini electorate, or Flatbush. Uh, he is also the deputy leader of the new Conservative Party. He has worked in a broad spectrum of industries, including tourism, steel, training, animal care, and more. He has also worked extensively with young people, including working within the areas of self-harm, suicidal ideation, sexual abuse, family violence, leadership facilitation, resilience, and self-confidence training. Uh, Elliot is a husband and a father, and he has also received the Police Commander's Commission for Bravery and Heroism for pulling three people out of a car minutes before it was smashed into by a truck. And I love this little quote, Elliot, from a recent press release from the party that was uh, attributed to you, and you said this, For the first part of my life, I was a part of the problem. For the remainder of my life, I will be a servant to my community. And I thought that was a great little thing to, to sort of kick tonight off with. Uh, before we get uh, too much further into things, Elliot, can you tell us about this incident with the truck? What the heck happened there? Oh. <laughs> well, well, first I was a rider. Oh, I love riding. Riding was awesome. So basically, I was uh, riding along State Highway 16. It was about uh, know, 8 o'clock at night or something like that. Uh, was driving, uh, riding back from West Auckland to Southside. And under, right underneath the Dominion Road, bridge there was a car uh, that was actually just fully out no hazards or anything like that now i actually rode past it and i thought nothing much more of it but then 100 meters down i felt oh no i just got to go back and check it just got to check it just in case yeah cruise back up there and i saw that there was uh, one person in the car and i sort of i sort of lost my noodle a bit <laughs> <laughs> then there's this guy with all his motorcycle gear on yelling at me and so I, I went over there and i just grabbed the person out of the car pulled them over and then I saw there was two more, and I flipped my noodle even more so. And I'll be honest, a few words were, were spoken quite strongly. As you do, as you do in these <laughs> moments. So, well, what are you doing? So uh, <laughs> went over, grabbed them out of the car, then I took my bike, parked behind their car, chucked the hazards on, and then I 
went uh, up State Highway 16, sorry, State Highway, yeah, 16, uh, went up the, the motorway and, or might be 16 or 20, can't, sorry, can't remember, went up the motorway and uh, basically just tried to uh, slow down the cars. After a while, it was quite a thundery night and one truck just came rolling in and poor guy, he just couldn't stop properly and it just smashed into the yeah. into the car, creamed out uh, the, the left-hand side and, and just, yeah. Brutal. Far, far mm. out, mate. That's pretty heroic. I've just had a notice to one of the comments as you were speaking come in from, I think it's uh, Nancy, but she's saying Murray Watkinson is watching you guys. Um, now, I, if that's Murray from Christchurch, uh, who used to be part of Celebration Centre, I knew your sons back in the day. So there you go. Um, I grew oh. up on the east side of Christchurch, so hello to you. Now, tell me, speaking of early in life, you, you say that um, for the first part of your life you were part of the problem. Oh yeah. What do you mean? T- tell us. I mean, you don't have to give us all the gory details, but you, you're on the other side of the tracks for a bit, were you? Yeah, I, yeah, I was, and, and I do attribute it to. I broke, I grew up in a broken home. Uh, there was, you know, there was some, some fist sort of stuff, physical stuff going on. Um, then I left, and then I went with mum, and their relationship broke down. So, uh, had multiple sort of broken home upbringing that led me to become quite angry, very angry young man. In fact, I. One of my stories is that I would sit down sometimes on a park bench and just out of the random go, <sighs> just to just to calm myself down. Lots of drugs, lots of girls, lots of uh, never never was a part of a gang, but got affiliated with a few gangs, and then went over to Australia. The whole drug scene got worse. Uh, came back. Then when I was 25, I did what some people do, and I accepted the Lord into my life. I accepted Jesus into my life. And as soon as that started, as soon as that happened, everything sort of twisted around. And I found myself able to sort of help young people from my history and experience of what I'd done. And then that just blew out into uh, a really great adventure for the next 20 years, actually. Great brother, adventure. Brother, I hear he's good like that. So there you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> very annoying how he just rips your, your turns your life around. And <laughs> well, it's good, mate. And, and what, what a great testament to that. And to have you on tonight, that's awesome. Tell me, let's jump straight into the topic. Um, there is a trend now, and it's. I think it's really been growing since probably the mosque shooting last year. We saw a lot of this, and it's really kicked off again of late, this accusation that uh, New Zealand is a racist country. Now, I uh, think it's it's probably, I think, foolish to say there's no racism in New Zealand because, you know, there's racist people everywhere you go. In every yep. culture, in every society, you can find people who say and do racist things to varying degrees. But I think it's also equally absurd to claim that we are a racist country or that we are a white supremacist nation. What What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> oh, well, I mean, I mean, utterly foolish to the point of being stupid. You'd, you'd have to be quite either, you'd have to be willfully ignorant to, to go for that. But you can actually sort of chop it up into two pieces mm. because what you'll find is that even the, the I remember Taika Waititi saying, oh, you know, yeah, yeah, New Zealand's uh, racist as. But it's this collective identitarian type of scenario where just because you are part of a certain group you are therefore deemed to be racist or fat shaming or hmm. or slut shaming or whatever the current wording is and this is actually what the, the the biggest problem of it is because it starts to become institutionalized when you look at racism and you look at bullying overall it doesn't matter what it is it just happens to be racism at the moment then you are always going to find within people there are disagreements and people will engage in positive and negative ways of how to resolve their differences. And so you will find that racism does get used. But yeah. then if we are talking about racism, then how far does that racism go? For example, you know, I, I went to, when I was at university, one of my failed attempts, and I went to university and I was uh, at, a, at a lunch, we were all together and I was jumping up the food. And then uh, some of the couple of Samoan girls actually looked at me and they said, oh, Oh, you're new in, eh? <laughs> because it's a bit of a new in thing to actually collect food before before the end of the of the scenario. You know, now that could be considered racist. Yeah. But it's because it was banter, because of the context of it, it yeah. wasn't racist. So that's actually what we need to separate is the idea of individual individual interaction and collective interaction. And that's the see, so we're because we are now engaging or we've seen that all of these various groups and these people are basically labeling entire groups as racist or homophobic or misogynist or whatever, that's actually the biggest problem that we're facing. And that's starting to become a cultural issue, even internationally speaking. 
So, no, we're not racist. We're just people who agree and disagree with each other. Uh, the concern, of course, is that we're starting to see the institutionalized or the idea of institutionalizing uh, anti-racism, which is not race, anti-racist, is actually a way yeah. of proclaiming white guilt and white people are bad and colonialism and a whole raft of measures which is going to hurt our people, not increase peace and conflict resolution. T tell me, uh, just before we carry on, someone has asked, are you two going to be answering questions? Yes, we are. We're going to have a time for questions at the end, so save those up, please, if you're sitting there wondering about that. Um, have you been challenged, obviously, uh, Elliot, you're a Nuean. Have you had people say, oh, you're selling out? Or, um, you know, in, in America, they call people uh, Uncle Tom, who are, you know, uh, black Americans, who say maybe you're getting a little bit too extreme with the accusations of racism. Have you had any of those kind of challenges thrown at you? On occasion. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see. Uh, I remember it came up. This is a fascinating story. When I was, Don Brash asked me to be part of a debate two days before the debate. So I went along, helped him out. And, and in it, I was talking about how it was disgusting, how how many people were trying to somehow say that uh, Pacifica and Māori somehow needed to be uh, kept safe from information. And somehow we, and I was basically making a statement that that uh, uh, Pacifica Māori deserve the right to hear all of the knowledge, hear all of the facts of anything, that we shouldn't be kept, quote unquote, safe from certain facts, even if we don't like them. Mm -hmm. And at that point, a guy up the back yelled, you race traitor, you race wow. traitor. Then I, I, I glanced up and I, I had to stifle a, a massive crack up because the dude was white as, <laughs> and he had long mullet hair. He looked like he was <laughs> bogan rule over in the, you know, West Auckland. It was, it was awesome. <laughs> but, and I love it. And, and I also found I get irritated sometimes with the protesters because they like to sing uh, Te Aroha, which is a beautiful waiata, a beautiful Māori waiata. What I find is that that's pretty much the extent of their knowledge of te reo Māori and tikanga Māori. <laughs> so sometimes I get irritated and I'll just blow it back at them. And sometimes I'll have to call it or eat te reo Māori until they shut up. <laughs> because what they're, what they're doing is actually far, is so incredibly racist. It is the the racism by condescending to a group yeah. of people. Yeah. And I find that to be powerful because I should have the right to speak, not from me being Māori, uh, Māori, Tongan, Nguyen, and English, but just because I am Elliot, because I'm a member of New Zealand, because I'm a member of the human race. Yeah. But these guys who are out there pushing it, they are far more racist than anyone else because they believe that we are weaker than them and therefore they that we should be somehow kept higher. So in a sense, you see it, what is it, an issue of agency, that, that like... Uh... The suggestion that only white people have agency uh, in our culture, and 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 we sh that, that we sort of look down on those who are not white as if they don't have any agency of their own, and and that's what a racist idea in and of itself, I guess, is that what you're trying to say? Yeah. How can, how do we succeed? How does Pacifica succeed? How does Māori succeed? Even in their whole term, Māori slash Pacifica, you know, we we're, we're not big fans of it. We're not actually big fans of the whole Pacifica Māori because, in actual fact, we are very different. Uh, even that term. Here's another term for it, which I, which, which many of us find incredibly racist, <laughs> is uh, what is it? Person of color. We, when did colored people? When did colored people become all good and acceptable just by switching around the words? Yeah, interesting. <laughs> I find a lot of the woke ones like to use it. So, uh, you know, they don't know their history. Yeah, they seem to regard us as weak. And I'm going down to Victoria University next Monday to debate Paul Spoonley. And I'm sure a lot of those woke people who've got no idea about what the hood looks like or what the, the real struggles that people like us actually go through in order to gain proper acceptance yeah. is. Yeah. So it's interesting, isn't it? One end of the spectrum, you've got someone like Winston Peters, who has, has who has, is a Maori man who has achieved the heights, right? He's, he's a guy who, love him or hate him, uh, illustrious career in politics, uh, he's the deputy prime minister. He's the guy who's been kingmaker, probably one of the most powerful positions in the land more than once. And and he's also a guy who grew up in a tent. I heard him speak at an event once. He's, you know, spent a part of his childhood living in a tent. And then you've got others at the other end of the spectrum. How would you describe your experience? Uh, you know, your your experience of growing up new way in uh, Tongan as well and Māori, and, and, and a bit of European as well into the mix. How How is that experience growing up in New Zealand in that background for you? Uh, yeah, actually, it was actually, the first part of my life was actually pretty hard because you're not, actually, you're not accepted into any one circle. 
And yeah. when you are quite young, then of course the the circles are a little bit more plain. You know, it's it's age, race, mm-hmm. and basically your your geographic area. That's pretty much what it is. So in terms of that, I found that I didn't fit in. Well, my brother and I, we didn't fit into any one particular group very well. However, when we became teenagers, what we found was that our mixed culture, our mixed blood, obviously, our, our the mixing of color, was we were able to actually go into every different type of circle, social circle that you can think of, whether it's everything from, you know, whether it's ethnic based, whether it was hip hop and then metal and then bogans, whether it was video gamer <laughs> culture, whatever the culture was, we learned actually uh, through through actually struggling in our early times, we learned how to operate and move through all the various different circles. My grandmother and my mother strongly, race is nothing. Race yeah. is nothing. Yeah. You make it or you break it on your own back, on your own two fists. Yeah. You, that's how you work. And so Nan and mum really instilled in me that you don't you let anyone else put you down. Don't let anyone else fake pull you up. But you, you work, you work hard, you be fair and good to everyone around you. That's how they were. And, and, and so race was never a part of it. So when all this race stuff came up, ooh, rubbed my hackles really badly. Not yeah. only that, of course, it actually damages our people. It doesn't actually help anything. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? Because it groups, I think it groups everyone into groups. So it's not just the assumption that um, people who are not European Kiwis are a particular or one singular homogenous group and as you've said it's not that way at all there's so much diversity even in those who are not european new zealanders but also um that all european new zealanders are in the same group um i've said previously on the show i was a white boy who grew up in a welfare class family we didn't know where our next meal was coming from on more than one occasion and if it wasn't for the help of others we wouldn't have been fed some nights. And, and and so, I mean, my parents struggled and did what they could. I, so when people talk about white privilege, I kind of think, well, gee, that must have been nice. And <laughs> and I wish my parents had known they could purchase some of that. It wasn't Kmart, it was Maxi Mart back then. You know, like, um, but, but oh. you know, it's this whole idea of lumping everyone into one singular group. There is no such thing as white privilege. Uh, mm. There is actually something called New Zealand privilege. Mm. If you are a New Zealander, then you've gained things such as the New Zealand system of social welfare. You gain assistance if you if you fall out of a job or you there are various mechanisms in New Zealand culture that if you are a New Zealander, then you are able to attack you are able to take some of these benefits and privileges from them. And those privileges is wonderful. The privilege is a great thing because it was instilled it was installed by people in our history. It's good. But now there's this again, you know, there's this new poisonous element who has tried to seek to poison good words such as privilege it's great we are privileged in new zealand and good on us we should be and it took hard work and it took a lot of blood and death as well to get that we've got the privilege of speaking freely and that's something which they want to take away well it's what we're doing tonight right and i think this is awesome this is what we need more of this kind of dialogue now helen's asked a question i think is worth asking she says um do you think all pakiha look at money as success and all maori don't and uh it's an interesting question. I, I, to me, I, I sort of think that perhaps that um, that there's something that that I think it's more those who've got wealth tend to get trapped in rather than along racial lines. What what do you think? Well, I think yeah, we probably do. Well, I mean, money is the resource of which we use in order to gain stuff, yeah, eat yeah. stuff, yeah, and yeah. do stuff. Yeah. So money is actually a really important thing that we, that we need. In terms of even if we go back historically, even if we're going to look back even pre pre-1840 days, we can actually see that even the acquisition of land and resources and mm. areas was actually an important need that, that was taken. You had the mercantile and the bartering system, yeah. and you also did have acquisition of land through military conquest. From my whakapapa, one of my ancestors actually was part of the warrior tribe uh, with Teropraha, and so he was a bit of a slave owner. And he, oh, yeah. He, yeah, he came down our way, just down the road, the Kaipoi Pass, seven minutes' drive oh, from us. Right. Oh, right, yes, yes. Orcs, orcs. <laughs> right, this, is, this interview's over. <laughs> nah, carry so, on. If we look at economics, it's through yeah. every single, it's a, it's a human nat- natural thing. That you've got resources, you want resources, and then you take resources, and then you can, whether that's by bartering or mercantile system or capitalism or military conquest or whatever, however it is done, uh, uh, the idea of acquisition is is an integral part of the human of the human need and uh, us as a people so uh, money if we use money as an example actually money is is something which is 
Yes, I would say money. But money, the word money, or tara, or tala, or however you might use that word, uh, can change. But the 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 philosophy, the principles, principles beneath it are always the same. Acquisition of resources that we need. Here's something I think that we could learn uh, from Māori culture, from uh, Pacifica culture. In fact, I was speaking to a group of uh, Pacifica church leaders uh, about two years ago on the issue of euthanasia. And uh, the question was asked from one of the ministers there, is this a big deal within the European communities, the whole idea of abandoning the elderly people? Because that's sort of very foreign to us, you know? And he's right. And I actually said to him, I said, you're right. This is a problem. We tend to have an individualism that is actually doing us great harm. And we need to, uh, what we really need is, is we need you guys to be those prophets in our midst who say, here's what uh, an authentic community built on extended family not just mum, dad, and their kids, but the extended family is supposed to look like, because that protects you against a lot of those issues, right? Yes. Yeah, that's right. And it's it's been quite, it's been pretty cool, actually. What's... What's seen as a more of a political, a more political sort of environment, as opposed to a church environment, which is why the church has been pretty silent on the matter until finally until maybe a, a month ago or a couple of months ago uh the what happened oh except for actually church is like celebration church actually i must admit he's awesome that guy um <laughs> the difference that you will find though is that the pacific most of the pacifica churches don't care they don't care if it's wrong if they view it as wrong then it is wrong and they've got no problem calling it out as loud and proud as it is yeah. whereas many of your many of the churches who probably i suppose more accurately came up with Western culture within the implementation of Western culture as our culture turned into what we refer to as a Western culture, they have become more and more stepping back and stepping out of society. Therefore, they are much weaker to the uh, onset of these very much libertarian, individualistic sort of ideas of suicide is fine, um, might makes right. Um, if I do kill my parents, then, yeah, you know, it's pretty bad, but, hey, you know, that's, that's, that's what I'm doing. So the when you've got those Pacifica churches coming out, uh, often interestingly enough, I think it's actually to do with a with a uh, uh, inexperience, which is excellent, rather than this jaded type of church who've been there for centuries and have been slowly taken over and worn down, or perhaps even have abdicated their role in society that they originally had, which was builders of society, and now they've sort of stepped back and uh, somehow think that that's fine when it's actually demonstrably not fine that's right the voice of the prophets eh? um tell me what do you think about the statue issue because we've heard a lot about that of late <laughs> i think the statue issue is just a, another attempt to erase history there's a wave that's been going through and it, and it, yep, it came from that um, that far left hate group uh, blm and it's been wending its way through but you know what it's done is is really it's it's sort of showing up it's a more it's a artic it's a sorry it's a escalation in an articulation of the removal of western civilization itself the the reasons racism actually doesn't have much to do with it because if that was the case again in new zealand a great example of course is teropraha his the the bust of his head on the pole that is down down south a little bit will not get touched even though he was a raging slave owner and he was a murderer and he was pretty brutal yeah uh, and so you know the the absolute hypocrisy that hate groups such as blm engage in and even actually if you look into their own website and their own beliefs that they've written out it's not actually about racism it's about uh the the two biggest causes that they have are, is alphabet ideology and also the uh, anti-westernism so they actually seek to disrupt as they and i'll, I'll point as much as i can to disrupt the western idea of family yeah, that's, that's what right. they want to get rid of so this the even the thing about racism people are looking at the wrong thing um now that said they are using race as a vehicle in which to truck in their hatred and their anti-westernism and unfortunately many ignorant people are going to fall for that and they will proclaim it as a virtue uh, and it's going to it'll damage them greatly because of course what it does do is it grows into this uh, uh, arbitrary morality police and the uh, uh, subjugation of free speech and the 
removal of institutions and uh, erase it just it revises history it erases it and it, it's, it's replacement for a different culture to come in tell me over the weekend uh maori party co-leader john tamahiri uh, went into the media and he said that uh, european kiwis were quote unquote asymptomatic racists <laughs> Now, good old John Tamahiri. You can't hey, fault him hey. for his inflammatory nature. Um, before I ask you what you think, it doesn't make sense because if you're asymptomatic, you've got no symptoms. So how can you be a racist if you've got no <laughs> symptoms of racism? Uh, oh, maybe yeah. you have racist thoughts every now and then. I don't know. But tell me, what what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> I thought it was it was crack up actually. I thought it was, I thought it was hilarious. Yeah, I was <laughs> laughing. <laughs> it was funny, yes. Um, but then when I guess when I had a bit of a sit down and a couple of cups of coffee, I had a bit of a think about it, and, and what I thought was uh, asymptomatic. Well, he's just jumping on COVID. He's just jumping on coronavirus. <laughs> so I think he's backpacking on that, and he's also backpacking on the whole uh, far left hate group BLM. Mm-hmm. So he's just backpacking on stuff just to gain some traction. So I so actually politically. I understand. He's, mm. He wants to throw out anything there. He's basically trolling the country. Yeah. So he's trolling the media, trolling anyone else out there who will get easily triggered. Uh, and that's what the idea of, of what he's doing is. So it's nothing more but words in the wind. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I thought it was quite dumb. It's some <laughs> great political theatre, right? Because they're polling below you guys, aren't they? Uh, if, I, if I remember correctly, when I last looked at the polls, I think that... Um, the 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 Ma- the Maori party is polling somewhere around 0.7%. It's it's about 300% below you guys, is that right? Oh yeah, something like that. I mean, <laughs> we know that the media don't like us anyway, so they like them more. So it's <laughs> yeah. like, oh well, well, you know, it's like, but uh, no, it's rubbish. Uh, in, in fact, uh, even going further than that, even when I was thinking about that word asymptomatic, it was, it was a dumb word to use, but you know, the idea again was to troll. But then it made me think also about these words such as uh, in, uh, unconscious bias. Yeah. And unconscious bias actually comes from implicit association bias. And there's an implicit association test, which is the, which is the unconscious bias test. However, uh, one of the authors of that actually did a study of, of 81,000 samples of that test because it's the, new, it's the big buzzword in America. And what they found was actually that uh, anyone who has unconscious bias which every single human being has some sort of unconscious bias. Some people like strawberry and other people like boysenberry. <laughs> yeah. But it did not come out in behavior. So you can carry whatever thoughts you had in your head, but by the very samples, the 81,000 samples that they took, what they realized was that, hey, even if there is such a thing as unconscious bias, it doesn't come out as a predictor in behavior. So if you've got someone who is, let's, you know what, let's go, let's go KKK. You've got yeah. a KKK member who's selling you Wendy's burgers. Well, the, the studies show from one of the authors themselves, the studies show that even that KKK person uh, on at Wendy's is not going to spit in your burger or, or ranch up your, your fries. They're not going to do that. Yeah. And so that's, it was just debunked, heavily debunked, and it's been debunked many times. It's interesting, isn't it? We had another incident last week that I think is worthy of conversation, and it sort of slipped under the radar. Remember last year we had that awful atrocity with the mosque shooting? Yep. And the narrative, the media narrative at the time was very clear. New Zealand is a hotbed of white supremacy and racism, and it was only a matter of time before this happened. What did we find out last week that in actual fact, I mean, we already knew he was an Australian who came to our shores initially yep. to train, and then he was going to go to, I think, Europe or America to carry out the act, and he just changed his mind and decided to do it here. But we discovered something that those of us who have been through the licensing process for firearms in New Zealand know and knew for a long time the police didn't do their job properly. He should have never got that license. He would have never been able to access the guns if he hadn't got the license. Now, that slipped under the radar, but that at the time was being talked about, but it didn't suit the narrative, right? Because it didn't play into this idea, no, 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 this is an expression of of, of the ultra-racism that underpins New Zealand. Yeah, absolutely. And it was, everyone knew, well, sorry, not everyone knew, but many of us knew that it was such a, a horrific uh, abuse and manipulation of such a horrific event. Everyone, knew, we all knew, you know, before the whole media came out with their report only a few days ago, showing the the systematic failures that gave that foreign coward the license in the first place. Yeah, we knew already that that the vetting process was sorely underdone because, uh, as you know, the <laughs> the firearms community man talk fast. It's oh yeah, real fast. So we all knew we all knew about the fact that that uh, uh, the two friends was actually online friends, you know, and yeah, yeah. 
got the red flags and the and the travel history. We all knew that. And so, you know, and then you had Patrick Gower talking about his expose on on white supremacy in the far right. Oh my and we were looking at it going, Oh, where is that it? Yeah, I, I mean, honestly, a bunch of dudes in Timaru with a flag, you know, want to separate from the rest of New Zealand. It's, oh, oh, you know, yeah, it's and, red is real. <laughs> and, you know, we've got, uh, uh, and actually, this was actually quite a quite a humorous, this was quite a humorous thing too, actually, is uh, there was a, there's a very far leftist blogger, very far left. Uh, actually, yeah, he's, he's in Christchurch. Uh, and he was actually, uh, and it is a bit to do with race. He's, he named three names. He named my name, the dude who wore a BLM hat, uh, sorry, mega hat to the BLM march, and uh, another dude who I haven't found out who that is yet. But he named those three, and he said, he said there is something going on with Polynesians and going to the heavy right, and we could do with a journalist or an academic to explain this phenomenon to us. And, wow. and I read that, and we released that Twitter, and, was, and I was thinking, can you not see that you are engaging in the very racism and white supremacy that you proclaim others that, to have. that is but, astounding right that is astounding it's one of, one of your homies one of, one of your area there right? <laughs> stupid white boys um okay. uh yeah no, that is that is astounding though eh? that is just i mean it's getting crazy out there um we had an awful incident happen here last week um a very shocking incident with constable matthew hunt may he rest in peace who was shot and killed yep. on the job. And for me, this is a stark reminder of how different our country is to America. So we've had this BLM wave. By the way, if BLM, Black Lives Matter, was just a slogan, I'd be right on board. But it's also a movement with political aims and goals, and those aims and goals are revolutionary, and they are very destructive in nature. And that's what I can't get on board with, period. However, even if you buy into everything they're saying about the American context, you're not going to question any of that. That's not New Zealand. And and that incident that happened on Friday where a police officer pulled over, random traffic stop, a car related to crime, they lose sight of the car, they come around the corner, there it is crashed, and then the guy gets out of the car and pulls a gun and immediately shoots and kills an unarmed police officer. Both, neither of them were armed in New Zealand. And you realise this is a very different context to the policing culture and what goes on in America, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and what I'm waiting to for word on is, uh, oh, first, it's just so so tragic. I mean, this is, a, I think it was about 11 years since the last brave hero that we've had go down in the line of duty. Um, so, but what we need to, what we're waiting for is word as to whether it's, uh, uh, if it's one of the 501s or if it's one of the uh, uh, groupings, because we're starting to see drug wars starting to take place yeah. in, in Auckland. As you know, I, I live in South Auckland. And uh, so we've seen actually what's been happening where the, the gangs are taking on more drugs and the 501s have been coming over and that's set the whole scene quite differently. Uh, and, and the whole race is just out the window. Uh, what was incredibly tragic as well was that uh, apparently apparently it, it was not just a bang-bang sort of situation. It was a multiple shots fired. Yeah. Uh, and, and yet again, that goes again to the fact that this horrific government has brutally manipulated a fog of fear has attacked a core culture of New Zealand, that is the firearms community, and yet they twice they asked the gangs, hey, can we have the guns back? And they both were, were very politely told, no, get stuffed. That and was astounding, and so publicly too, right? They just said, no, we're not giving that back our guns. And and, and, the, and, very, and, and, and just the, the government and the police went, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay. yeah they, <laughs> and so, you know, this is the horror of what this government, and, and, and I know, I, I know I, I'm political, so obviously I, I am political, but... That's why I commonly say that this is actually the most important election that we've had in the history of New Zealand. We've never had, we've never had the threats like this. We've never had a government engaging in this. In fact, you know what? That that uh, uh, the foreign dude, the Australian guy who murdered those people, you know, one of the biggest things, of course, is that we need to have free speech so we can actually discuss ideas like that, refute them, pull them to pieces, and mock them or destroy them, so that that's how we engage. And what we've seen is that those who have been on extremes, extreme right, extreme left, have engaged when they have engaged in free speech and been allowed to spread out their disgusting ideas and then had better ideas and discussions back and forward, yeah. their extremity goes down. And Jordan Peterson is actually a really great one. He's I have seen him work with patients on this, and he actually, you can actually see that their extremity, on whichever the extremity is, does calm down and go into a more normal atmosphere because 
because you've got to have free speech to enable ideas to be attacked and discussed and, and wrestled with. It's it's um, vitally important. And yeah. we've seen those being now. Yeah, well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because you send people into echo chambers and what do they do? They sit in the echo chambers, they reinforce evil ideas. But if you can bring, there's a great story in the States about a guy who was hugely effective at bringing, he's a, he's a black American who's been hugely successful oh, bringing people out of the Klan. Yeah. And these white, what is, how does he do it? Through personal interaction with these guys. So they don't get stuck in the echo chamber. They are forced to confront this. This is a this is a, a an African American man. It's a different. It's a completely different thing to the whole ideology I've been sold. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. Free speech is is the greatest. It's it's the first. It's the cornerstone of all freedoms. Of course, free speech is the cornerstone. If we lose freedom of speech, then all other freedoms on top of that get lost. So that's the first one. And of, of course, we paid in blood for it as well. Um, but it is the most effective tool for uh, making our world a better place. You cannot make your world a better place without the freedom of speech, which is also why it's quite not ironic. It's actually unsurprising that this current government, because they believe that they seem to know all the ideas and can fix things by throwing taxpayer money at it. Of course, now we see them starting to shut down those avenues of free speech. It's uh, it's interesting because I, I heard uh, thinking back to the to the killing of, of um, Constable Matthew Hunt. And I was reminded straight away of, um, I talked about this last week on the show, the, the Black Lives Matter march that happened in Auckland the Saturday before. And we had a lady get up from People Against Prisons, Aotearoa. The name is literally what they, they believe. They don't believe there should be any prisons in New Zealand at all. Uh, yeah, it's a bit scary. Um, but she said this, and I'll quote, Truth is that we live on a graveyard in Aotearoa with New Zealand police laying down the bodies. And you realise, oh my gosh, that that's... That, that what happened on Friday is, is just the complete proof and antidote to that lie, right? Yeah, it, that's absolutely disgusting. And, and mm. I have come across these guys before. Uh, you know, there are some more more less extreme ones there that they that they talk on. Interestingly enough, and I'll tell you this, they're also very much uh, uh, hooked up with um, uh, Action Station. Uh, yeah. Now, Action Station, of course, have this, they've sent stuff to Andrew Little that Andrew Little is reading. So right now we're watching, uh, oh, sorry, I've been hearing, that in actual fact the prisons are starting to have to be changed little bits um i'm uh, i'm not allowed to give too many details yet because i haven't been given authority to say it but let's just say there's some real scary stuff going on in the in the corrections facilities right now now what those groups were saying were things such as that a uh, crime there's uh, so in the report there our Fano report and this is the one that andrew little has read and what he's building his justice policies on is that there is no such thing as crime crime is not actually real what they are is acts of survival oh, not wow. crimes are acts of survival the number of reason for acts of survival occurring is because of colonialism yeah. and that's it so when they did that an entire report and I, I did a very boring video clip on this but uh, it was very much succinct in stating that uh, the there was no availability for family to be a protectant against future recidivism or any other crimes or offenses and so they are really pushing not just for no prisons but no police they want to basically they want to basically do chas which is in the u.s they they effectively what they want is to make it so that there are no police there are they're basically community workers they're all going to engage uh, in love and peace and harmony and and somehow that's going to be okay now, usually we'd be able to laugh about this and have a crack up, good old crack up over it. Just, ha ha, you guys, ooh. However, this is, these reports are going to the government who are listening to them and they're changing things. And like I said, I can't say too much, but let's just say the prison facilities are changing right now in gear for this government to get in. And if it does, if I'm trying to check to see if it's accurate what I've been hearing, but if it is, it is some scary, scary right. stuff. Well, here's the deal. Once you've confirmed the accuracy, you can come back on here and we will talk about just that issue because that is, oh. I think, worthy of exploring because uh, the media ain't doing it for us, quite frankly. That's why I started this show. Um, uh, here's the thing. I, I remember as a young man growing up on uh, in the east side of Christchurch, a little place called Burwood, uh, I went to Morihau High School, the Academy of Higher Learning, we used to call it. Uh, I was asked to I was asked to leave before I even finished, and I think some of my oh, classmates <laughs> are now in jail. Um, and um, but here's the thing I remember about that: I had so many great friends. One of my best mates in high school was a Maori guy. He's a good man, a very good rugby player. Actually, he was able to play for Canterbury at the age of seventeen. The, the A squad got in there, um, and um, uh, I remember 
the friendships we formed. I remember going along to a, a youth, big Christian youth rally thing, and there was this awesome adult kappa haka group that did this amazing haka that they had written, and it was the whole story of um, of the life of Jesus, and then he goes down into the tomb, and they're down on the floor, thump on the floor, and then the resurrection, uh, it was full noise, it was glorious. And I remember just being so awestruck by all of this, and it seems that opportunity for dialogue and unity and community is just being broken down now. And it seems yep. sometimes very deliberately. Yep. Yes, yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, and this Actually, what the big message that I would say to everyone who's, who's watching and listening is you're going to be very much encouraged. <laughs> Look, I'm doing a lot of air quotes tonight. So <laughs> <laughs> you're going to be very much encouraged to apologize. You're going to feel like you should be saying sorry for something. You're going to be saying that, uh, um, oh, but I've got, I've got Maori friends. I've got Pacific friends. You've got those. Yeah. No, don't apologize. Yeah. Don't apologize. Don't apologize if you've got nothing to apologize for. If someone, And not only that, even as an effect, they are only looking for a weakness. They're not looking for resolution. They're looking for weakness. And when they find it, they're going to jump in and exploit it, and then they're just going to twist you into a million ways. Yeah. They, it is a, I heard that, that BLM actually was at a – was it in Christchurch? But I heard that BLM had a thing in, in a church uh, uh, to discuss Black Lives Matter sort of nonsense. And I think it was in Christchurch. Oh, now, no. come, come it's, there, pile, it's piling up against me here now. That's <laughs> a free speech hard. But, uh, you know, uh, in there. But uh, just to all your listeners, Black Lives Matter does not care about black lives. They really, really don't. Don't forget, they have, they abuse and they manipulated a situation with a dude who had fentanyl and meth in his system. They didn't care about the, the uh, half a dozen black guys killed during their riots, a couple of them police and a couple of them capped in the back of the head. They didn't care about the black babies being killed. They also don't care about the fact that the number one death for a young black man in America is murder by another young black man. They don't care. They don't care. And okay, I, I I, go, I, I, okay. Let, let, let's get into that then, because the, obviously there is great disparity. And even here in New Zealand, in some of these communities, they're dealing with poverty, fatherlessness. Um, they're dealing with high, they're overrepresented in, in the prison uh, statistics, Māori, for example, Māori men. How do we navigate these issues? It seems to me that what's going on right now is actually, it's not even addressing those, and it's actually destroying our ability to address those very issues. How do we address those issues? Absolutely right. You are absolutely right. Uh, so while all of the millions of dollars being chucked into nonsensical ideas and intervention process and, and, and nonsense stuff like racism, uh, they are missing the big one. And you actually mentioned it just before. So we'll use the – since we are talking about BLM, let's go to the American example first. In the American example, you've got a black uh, – the black Americans, uh, they have something like about 75% grow up fatherlessness. Hmm. Fatherlessness. Now, if you look at those waves – in terms of the family unit breaking down, it didn't start breaking down until the late 60s. That's when it started to break down. And Thomas Sowell was my favorite intellect, oh, yeah. uh, intellectual. He said this, the black family has survived centuries of slavery, generations of Jim Crow law, but has disintegrated in the wake of the liberals' expansion of the welfare state. Yeah. And Lyndon Bain Johnson in the 60s, realized that he, he was not he was going to lose the black vote, and he also realized he was going to he did not like black people. He used the N word quite liberally, apparently, yeah. uh, and he said, "All right, I'm going to have those N words voting for me for 200 years." How did he do it? He put in so many social benefits and and welfare programs that it just spread. And it, what it did do was it actually subsidized solo parenthood to the point. And before this, the black family was actually strengthened. It was strong. It didn't matter whether it was... Oh, it was stronger stronger than white in America, right? In the 50s, according to the data, you were more likely to be living in a solo parent home if you were a white kid. Yes, absolutely right. Mm -hmm. and, and that has now come to be a, a horrific area. So now you've got 13% of the population in America actually committing about half of the murders and half of the robberies. So that's you want to talk about those, those horrible things, that's where it happens. Let's go to New Zealand. In New Zealand... In the late 70s, you had around about 80% chance of being born into a married mum and dad home. Now, it's 20%. Wow. It's gone from 80% to 20%. And for the politicians and the Black Lives Matter people and the, uh, uh, the action station and all that, they don't want to talk about that. Yeah. They want to talk about a whole bunch of other stuff. But the fact is that if you were born Māori in this, in this country, you have a 20% chance of being born to a married mum and home. And the best data... The, the three biggest longitudinal studies are 
incredibly clear that if you are born and raised in a married mum and dad home, you have better chance of getting into the middle class, you've got a better chance of making positive choices, uh, engaging in your kids in a really healthy way, getting good jobs, not going to prison, not committing suicide, not engaging in self-destructive and numbing behavior. But we don't want to talk about that. Instead, we want to talk about these other areas of issues. The biggest issue is family breakdown. Okay, then is this a question? I've heard this from African commentators in Africa who have said one of the biggest problems they are dealing with in Africa, this is the African community, is the imposition of Western colonialism through morality. And what they say is that you export your immoral view of the family into our culture and it's destructive and you're doing us no end of harm. Are we seeing something similar here? Is this part of the problem, that you've got an ideology that's married it up, itself up to a very libertine view of sexuality and that's done? A, that's it's not doing all the damage but it is contributing greatly to the problem here? I don't know about the Africa because you're talking about Africa, Africa, right? You, you mean yes, like a, I am, yes. Yeah, I, to be honest, I don't know about the... the I don't know about the demographics and the patterns of process around there. I'll probably go back to I'll, I'll probably go back to the fact that uh, in terms of having sexuality within a monogamous relationship has mm. been utterly helpful, and it's also shown us that any area where you've got that that moral fiber or you've got that uh, institute that brings in a moral fiber. So if we're talking Western culture, of course, we're talking about the Judeo-Christian principles and ethics that is brought by the by the church, whatever that denomination might be. But in every single nation, what we have seen, every single nation, is that it's, it has increased quality of life, it has increased productivity, it's increased wealth for every for every group. Now, different rates of growth, absolutely, sure, but growth of every single race. And a great example, that's why I do say to some people who are BLM, because I've got some friends over in Chicago and Colorado, yeah. and, the, and black guys, and uh, one of the big things they say is, hey, there is no better place for a black person to be than in America. Yeah. And that's with all of the BLM people saying, oh, slavery, slavery. I don't see them going over to Africa. I don't see them going to Africa at all. Uh, and the, the, the fact is that everywhere that this, that this institute or the churches or have brought the morality of the Western culture with them, it's actually been better for them, not worse. Yeah, and that's and that's accounting too for sinful human behaviour, right? Where there there have been those excesses and evils that have also come with it. But overall, you'd have to say it's it's weighted in a particular particularly probably favourable. That's the right? thing I've always loved about uh, Western culture, and also is that it's self correcting Yeah, because because you had slavery, who got rid of yeah. it first? Western yeah. culture what was it under the Judeo Christian principles and ethics. That's how it got rid of. Yeah, tell me uh, what as people are saying. There's a generational issue here. Um, I remember talking to one of my family members who was has a good friend of his who was involved in a policing trust that uh, or it was a sort of community trust that was set up to break these sort of cycles because uh, he talked about a story as a police officer going to arrest a young man I think it was for failing to turn up to court or something like that and the father sat there on the chair with a beer in his hand laughing as his son was being wrestled to the ground to try and take him away because he was resisting. And then it suddenly dawned on this older police officer, I'd been in this home before and I'd had the same experience with the father uh, some years ago. And here it was repeating itself. He said, I, what can I do to help stop this? So what can we do to, to intervene and to intercede in that sort of generational breakdown to stop those cycles? What's the practical yeah. solutions? Oh, man. Woo! <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and we haven't got all night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because... I'm trying to take my own politics. Well, sorry, no, not my own politics. It's my ideology to politics. But I'm trying to take my own party out of it. <laughs> if you implement our party policies yeah. that are designed specifically yeah. from people who spent <clears throat> decades on the field, the the reason be that's why that's why I'm finding it difficult because <laughs> basically all I need to do is chuck in all of our policies in here, and you want to find out how to do it. That's how to do it. Now, the length of time is that's the problem. Because you are talking about generational, as you mentioned, therefore it does, it will take generations to fix. There's, there is no real, there is no uh, uh, quick fix in here. You can't yeah. throw money like this government's been doing because it hasn't worked. And it, it, we can see that in the rising suicide stats and also some of the crimes that are increasing are more depraved and sexual and, and violent nature. So the what we need to be doing is to, what we need to be doing is getting a bit tougher in some areas because some areas are just going to need to be managed. You can't intervene. Yeah. I would love to say, yep, no worries, mate. You just throw money and then the, and then everyone's going to hug each other and it's cool by Won't happen. Yeah. So there are some situations that are going to need to be uh, fixed. For example, if you've got someone who's an unrepentant offender, 
uh, they need to be quite held to account themselves. Their own actions are going to need to dictate when they come out of prison. That's yeah. something which is really important because it, what happens is that by the time a young person is 16, maybe 16 and a half, the neurology after that is a pretty much 95% formed. Mm. What that means is that if you've got someone who has learned to be uh, uh, barbaric and brutal and they've learned that, that to solve uh, issues takes violence and, and criminal activity, then that's pretty much how they're going to be naturally. And so anytime if they've turned a corner and they're going to choose to do right in their life, they're going to be fighting against that nature. I do. I'm very quick. I, I still have from time to time, I will, I will react quickly and I know I can react quite sharply to the point of being violent if I don't check myself in that. So what we need to do is to look after those who have been raised up. So the first three years of life and the first 16 years of life are everything. Yeah. That's where you've got to uh, really help out. And, but then if you're talking about intergenerational, if you've got a dad who's abusive or just not even there, then the problem is, of course, and, and I think uh, Nick Tortassi said this, is that uh, uh, if there's no father in the home – oh, no, sorry, Denzel Washington got said this, my <laughs> other hero. Um, if there's no father in the home, they will go out on the streets and they'll find one. Yeah. So the issues that you're talking about, they can be fixed most definitely. And it's not hard either. That's yeah. the thing. It's not rocket science. But the politicians will not do it. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? So really virtue is needed. And I think here, if we had, how do you learn family? It's got to be taught by role modeling. You've got to, you, and you've got to experience. So what you need is families that can almost adopt families where the, the breakdowns happen, right? And actually give them a vision that is authentic. And that's not easy. Because it's a lot easier just to throw cash at things and say, here, sort yourself out. And in a very individualistic culture, that seems like this quick fix. But what you actually need is a, a lot harder, more dedicated, what I guess in Christianity you would call discipleship, really. The hard yes, business, yes. you know? Oh, gosh, we need more discipleship, that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, and I think that uh, we, we see more people start to desire that. Uh, and I think that um, it's very much a male thing as well, because uh, the females, you know, whether it's a neurological aspect of it, they seem to be a bit more innate in their ability to understand how to deal with things going on around them and, and to work it through. Whereas as men, we are a lot more, we're strong, powerful, and very focused. But if we don't have something to, to seek alongside, or we don't have someone to teach us the ways, we become incre incredibly damaging and brutal because that focus and the strength and the passion just goes into some real dangerous sort of areas. So we seem to really need a lot more in terms of that mentoring, that fatherhood. And that does also go in terms of when we're being raised. It's actually uh, up until around about that mid-10, uh, uh, 11 stage where mum's everything, and then the teenager crosses over into teenage, and suddenly mum's a little bit obsolete, not obsolete, but <laughs> a little bit less needed, and yeah. dad becomes absolutely everything because it's the father who'll engage in the uh, um, uh, resourcefulness, creativity, resilience, ambition. So they'll feed on the other part until – the child is ready by the time 16, 17 to spread out on their own. It's one of those great things of humanity. Fatherhood, eh? So important. And motherhood together. You need and that comp complementarity. The male-female complementarity oh, is absolutely, absolutely essential. And at the very moment in history when we're saying that neither of those things exist in the real world, they're all just a subjective social construct. Absolutely. That um, last question, because uh, before I open up the floor for people who might want to ask questions of you, um, Elliot, it seems to me that if we're even going to begin to hope to address some of those issues, we've got to have authentic, open dialogue happening across racial lines. Yeah. And so how the heck do we actually build the authentic unity that we need first as a base to then reach into those communities? Because without that, I don't see how we can actually do that, pull our resources and help. Yeah, so I mean, free speech is everything. And we've... we've we are in a very crossroads of our time this year. This year is a really incre incredible crossroads. We either we either gain back all the free speech losses that we've lost, mm. or we lose the rest of them in this selection. Um, and I think that's the first step. The first step is that we've got to stamp down that the government or the or our leaders or the people at the top of our culture of our nation say that free speech is great and we're going to protect it. After that, we need to be able to have people like like yourself who is starting on alternate ways of being able to discuss and, and talk. Uh, there was the, uh, oh, I think you might have mentioned it as well, the uh, uh, Kiwi blog, the, the Courier poll, that showed that the incredible bias. Of, yes, I'm talking about that later on in the show. Oh, right, right. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Come on, mate, don't steal my thunder here. <laughs> so, you know, it's just basically we've got to be able to get out into the public events, whatever the events are, 
and be able to engage in free speech wherever it is. Uh, I was a part of a free speech, few speech, free speech rallies in Auckland, and oh, they were such great fun. We had people uh, attacking me for my statistics on social on, on socialism and the murder rate. And then we had some uh, who were talking about uh, talking about everything, and oh, it's such a beautiful thing. It's a shame that our universities were, which were supposed to be bastions of great intellectual, mm-hmm. uh, gladiatorial type environment, have now just become your meat grinder for for young minds and just trying to turn them into leftists. But I think just jumping on everything and, and every medium, every platform, every publisher, just going for that free speech element. I think it's just it's, that's how we get there. Well, it seems to me too that that just that authentic community is so essential as well. Like I, I think about my own church community. And the fact that if, if, if you've got authentic community happening in your church, you, you should be walking into a very multi, multicultural building uh, or environment on a Sunday morning. And I think you think about how a lot of that's sort of broken down as well. And, 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 and it used to be uh, across, uh, out, it used to spill out from Sunday morning into the community. You had a local community. You knew people who weren't just you and your, maybe your wife or your husband and a couple of kids behind a picket fence. There was, there was a sense of engagement that actually helped to build the very thing that we need now so desperately, right? Absolutely. Yep, absolutely right. Right, well, f- folks, the, the question is, uh, the floor is open, sorry. Um, if you have any questions you'd like to ask Elliot, anything at all, uh, while he's here. Um, Elliot, do you think, um, h- how, do you, how do you favour your chances uh, at the upcoming election? You'd probably be, be sort of pretty happy at the moment, wouldn't you? You guys are doing all right in the minor party stakes. I'm oh, very happy. He is very happy, very confident. We've... Um, We've never been as strong. In fact, we've been stronger than we are even in 2014. So we went through the fire and the drama. We went through a lot of downs. We took a lot of scars. And yet uh, from 2018 to now, we've become so incredibly strong. It's, it's just not even funny. In fact, it's quite exciting. I, I thought I had to put up my own billboards, for example, because I did that on the other years. And then I had my team growl me. said, well, what are you doing? No, no, no. You guys, you stay there. We're doing this. Uh, in fact, I'm going to Wellington because churches have asked for us to turn up and i've got eight meetings in two days it's not because of us it's because what they want to they want us to get in there and and discuss and talk about things so the the it's so much stronger and so powerful and i think that's it's quite beautiful it's quite beautiful and it feels right no matter how many times i get called uh uh, various bad names and homophobe and transphobe and race traitor and uncle tom and coon and all the various names wow it feels good it's a right thing because it's for our nation and it's for our freedom. Well, wow, that's yeah. Gee, that must that can't be easy. I, I think, um, yeah, it's funny, isn't it? I I think about all the the advances that we we were seeing. Just sort of, it's felt like there was a really positive roll on until all of a sudden we're in this phase now at the moment where. I mean, my kids are learning Tadeo at school. I, I didn't have that opportunity. I'm trying to piggyback on the back of that now to learn some stuff myself. And it seemed like there was all these positive things starting to happen. And all of a sudden, we've now come into this really divisive sort of space. And, yep. uh, and it, it's, it's, you know, there's a great the, danger in that. The, this government has, has worsened race relations than any other time that I can ever remember. Yeah. Wow. Uh, someone says here, Francis says, what are your party policies to strengthen families? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. Well, the first one that I would say is our first one. The, my One of my favorites is the first $20,000 is yours. It's tax free. It means that the government won't take your tax. So that, that basically equates out to be around about 50 bucks in the hand after any other type of tax is taken take out or whatever. Is you, you're, the first $20,000 that you earn is yours. That means about 50 bucks in the hand. If you're mum and dad, that's about $100 in the hand. That's football shoes. That's date night. That's being able to take them off to somewhere else. That's, that's a, a family feed. You know, $100 a week is incredible. Not only that, we also have income splitting. So one of our guys is actually, he's got 90000 or Sorry, one of our people who became a supporter, uh, he's at $90,000. Uh, <clears> his wife <throat> is actually the stay-at-home mum. But with income splitting that we would have, basically that means that he would say, they would save about $15,000 a year in that tax rebate, which means that that's already, they can get that into a home. Uh, and they can start saving up in a really way, best way that possible. The other ones that we would have is um, we're also very strong in terms of, well, I'm trying to think of it in terms of, of, of prevention, intervention, and their management. So we also have a very much a strong suicide policy. Uh, I don't have time to go into that, but it's in depth and it's built by the clinicians who are in the suicide field currently. Um, we've also, our youth policies, we're very much against things like uh, legalizing THC, 
Um, so we would be very fierce on that. For those youth who are very high at risk, we also have the boot farm policy. Uh, that's a that's a, a little pet project. I love that one myself personally, as well as those of us who built it. Um, that's take care of that, that upper tier who, who just engage and become killers. Uh, and then on top of that, we also have justice policies, which do things such as uh, three-stage sentencing, which looks at rehabilitation properly without giving uh, rewards for restoration or anything like that. Uh, and the other elements, we also will try to uh, uh, bond the families together. So we, we would also remove gender ideology from schools and replace it instead with uh, relationships training. So that's conflict resolution and understanding about uh, male-female dynamics and the, the areas that are in there as well. Um, so yeah, there's, there's lots in there, but, but have a look. Please have a look. There's, there's lots in there. I, I keep on popping over to honor oh, this one, and I'll say this one, and I'll say this one. But yeah. please have a look, and feel free to contact us. But uh, our policies are in there, broad and as blunt as can be. Well, we're going to have, by the way, uh, there is a plan to bring Leighton Baker on the show in the coming weeks, who's the leader of the party, and to actually put the political policy questions to him on the show, because the media aren't giving you that shot, and I think people should hear that. Um, let me finish with a comment we've had come in from uh, Murray Watkinson, I think it is here. Um, he says, sounds a bit idealistic, but it, it would be good if we supported each other in reaching the goals that are important to people from different nations or cultures. I hate the competition, winners and losers. I don't think that's idealistic at all, Murray. I think that's uh, that's the kind of sort of goals that we need more of, right? Where we actually, we, we get together and say, how can I uh, love my neighbour more effectively and authentically? Yeah, and it's not hard. This stuff is none of the stuff that we have is actually rocket science. It's a yeah. uh, and not only that, it, re, it it saves us a lot of money. We spend a lot of money on virtue signaling. I'll give you that now. <laughs> yes, yeah, get offline and go and live in the real world with some people from a different culture and just have dinner with them, have a beer with them, and and and, and just be with them. It's the way to do yeah, it. Right? it. Elliot, thank you so much for being on the show. It was just such a privilege. And man, the time has flown by. We've still got a bit more to cover, folks, so stick around. But Elliot, thank you. A huge thank you. And I definitely want to bring you back on the show, mate. Thank you, mate. Cheers. Cheers. When we wake, hear the birds and see the sun. Side by side, our fears are done. All the good times just begun. Let's hold on tight Found what we're looking for in life Call us crazy But things are finally right With you and I The future is